All right. Good morning, Zach. Uh, full disclosure, this will be our third time. First time is my fault. Um, I started rambling and said, hey, can we please start over? You're like, sure. And then the internet decided to uh, come and take out Try too. So third time's a charm. Great. We got, worst part is we got great topics to talk about. I was going to say the Ravens. So the Ravens game is going to be great. I'm going to give us a good 10, 15 minutes to go over the Ravens here. I know you got a lot going on. There's so much going on today. It's like a gambler's paradise. Mm -hmm. um, I know you're not the biggest. Every sport. Uh, but there's just so much action. I got a million things I want to do. But the thing I wanted, the thing I was most excited to talk to you about is the state of the NFL. Because mm -hmm. it is a popular topic of the, the play just sucks, right? Um, there's no really hot take the other way. It's like, oh, the NFL has been great this year. It's the, the narrative is the NFL, it's hard to watch. These Thursday night games always go under. And then Tom Brady put the exclamation point on it this week by, I guess, saying what everybody has been saying. So yeah. I'm like, all right, I always like to see, is, is there something that we're missing here? Or what's going on? And Bill Barnwell, who's probably in the top five of, mm -hmm. you know, um, just NFL guys that you want to follow on Twitter. Anyway, he reposted an article from 2016 that a gentleman, um, I'm going to butcher his name, so we'll just credit him later. Um, he writes the article saying, uh, basically having all these quotes in 2016 showing that people's dissatisfaction for the state of play, like similar conversations that we're saying now. And some of the quotes are just unbelievable. So I want to dive into it with you. Um, we're not the oldest guys in the world, but we've watched football now for a long time. And so let's just have a conversation about it. I want to give you, I'll let you get the first crack at it. Cause some of these quotes from in the years are just, unbelievable so where what's the first one that jumped out at you first one that jumped out at me was a quote from 1999 saying playing quarterback in the nfl used to be glamorous now it can be hazardous to your health and then a little bit down it says quarterbacks were stars they were leaders they didn't walk they swaggered and i just feel like back then they're like there's never gonna be any great star quarterbacks since then this wasn't Tom Brady was just about to like kind of hop like there were so many like in 1999 think of everything that happened in the NFL since then and they were saying well it's over there are gonna be no more good players back then so that was one of those quotes where I saw and I was like I remember myself you know when we see Brady the Mannings all of them retired and it's like the golden age of football is over. They were saying it the exact same thing. Pull up, pull up the 1990, what's it, 1990? No, it's 2000. Do you have the Troy Aikman quote in front of you or what Aikman said about free agency and the salary cap? Let me go grab that real quick. Yeah, because I was just actually reading through that because he said something about, uh, yeah, the quality of play throughout the NFL has suffered because of three-pronged pressure created by free agency the salary cap and expansion. I don't think the level of talent around the league is as consistent as it once was. So that, so that was him saying that. So, so I wanted you to read that before I asked you this. So that was him in 2000, Troy Aikman saying, man, really the salary cap and expansion watered down football, blah, blah, blah. Right. So I was like, he's basically saying 1993. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to figure out what year football was at its best. All right, so I'm going through this article. I'm like, all right, so it wasn't 2016. It wasn't uh, 1999. Troy Aikman thinks it was 1993. So I was like, all right, I got the internet available to me. Why don't we look up the passing statistics in 1993? Um, do you want to take a wild get? Like, I'm just, this is unbelievable. Like, the perspective is just gone. So we have Steve Young, 29 mm -hmm. touchdowns, 16 interceptions, 4,000 yards. Some guy named Bobby Herbert was the third rated quarterback that year. I really don't know who he is. I thought, do you know who Bobby Herbert was? At what team? That was the Falcons. Oh. Steve Berline. Now I remember him. He was a top 10 quarterback, but he had 18 touchdowns and 17 interceptions. Some guy named Craig Erickson. So it, look, this isn't to, um, here, here's the point I want to make. You can have the opinion. And I think you're right to say football was way more physical five years, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. But then you also have to say it was way more physical 50 years ago. 
Um, yeah. I read a book, Art Donovan, um, legendary Colts line when back when football was like for real men. And that he wrote that in 1987 and was killing Jim McMahon for, you know, not being tough enough. So it's but been, you imagine if what like, Jim McMahon's era, if that that is seen as like brutality at this point to what the NFL is now. And back then it was like, wow, the league has really gotten soft. And it's just always going to be this thing of we just keep getting worse. And it's honestly not to make this a military history um, podcast, but those guys served in the military. So it was a completely different mindset. Um, That's why football has a military mindset to begin with. And if you want to have the opinion, so what I'm getting at is if you want to have the opinion that football has gotten you know, softer and the rule changes make it less fun for you to watch. I don't even think that's an arguable position, but where you lose me. And I think you lose credibility amongst um, historians and people that really watch the game is when you start saying the coaching and the quarterback play is the worst that's ever been. And it's, and then you really have to look back and be like, well, when was it at its best? And so the reason I really wanted to talk about it is I love football. I know you love football and feel like everybody listening obviously loves football and we have to be able to I don't know I, I think have the the proper perspective that the yeah. game was not going to grow unless they changed the physicality you know the UFC doesn't require 53 guys on a roster um so that kind of brutality and whatever that's there's a market for that there always will be and the people that wanted that from football have to have the perspective yeah it's just not that's not not gonna be especially you know ufc those guys fight at once every six months these guys are lacing them up every seven days i mean so you can't be going out there and just literally you know people will look at me like oh these were the good old days and it'll be a montage of just cte just over and over pretty much happening it's like there are people that really just would prefer that. And it's like, that's, that's how we have guys with three year careers that are really good because they're like, I can't do this anymore. Yeah. I mean, did you watch the Barry Sanders documentary yet? Yes. It, so it just depends on what you, I just don't, I guess I don't, I don't know. I, I hate feeling like I'm on my uh, high moral mountain here, but it frustrates me when people are complaining about watching the game. It's like, they mm-hmm. gotta watch something else. Cause it's just a different, it's, enjoy it for what it is instead of pretending like the quarterbacks used to be amazing 10 years ago. It's just not the case. Now, with that being said, um, there's certainly things to criticize There's certainly things to, but I think we got to stop comparing and pretending like the quarterback play used to be way better than it is now. No. And I think if anything, you would ar- argue that it's better now, just out of pure, what these guys know with all the film, all the training, like with just so much recovery and like where science has gotten their bodies and stuff. That's another thing is like in the past 30 years where the training staffs, all that has come, the training routines is just insane. It's literally like completely different athletes out there. So I think that's another thing you have to take into account is like, Everyone was on the same level pretty much with their training and everything as the years have gone. But if you put people with, you know, 2023 athletes and all that they've done compared to the guys in the 60s, the guys in the 60s are not doing as much, you know, the plyometrics and, you know, let's do these routine stretches through that stuff. They just showed up to the field and they're like, Okay, let's go win this football game. And it's just lazy. It's, frank, it's just lazy content to compare the eras. It's it's yeah. hot. it's just Thank not. God. Frankly, the conversations that that you have on your podcast, on the Ryan Ripken podcast, and what I'm aiming to do over here is find things that are actually thought provoking, mm-hmm. or we can, you know, we're not just complaining about where yeah. things are at. So anyway, with that being said, um, let's go right into the let's go into the Ravens Chargers. Um, the Chargers, I guess, speaking of complaining, if I was a Chargers fan, I don't know, like, I would hate to think I'd give up because I'm an Orioles fan and we've been through a lot, but the way they've lost, um, over the years, it is, 
And so now they go from losing these brutal games to the the play. It used to be like just bad field goal kicking at the end of the games. And now mm. it's combined with terrible coaching, um, just such bad situations. And the coaches throwing players under the bus and yeah. So they're a train wreck. Uh, they're a dumpster fire. They're like, okay, the Chargers, but they're not dumb, right? They're four and six. Um, and so that's what's sure. scary about it. So how do we see? Let's get right into it. I think. Let's let's be honest. It was great that we beat the Bengals, but it was 10-7 when Burrow got hurt. And you told me that you thought they were going to be throwing the ball a lot. It looked like they were doing that. They were having some success. Is that what the Chargers are going to do? Um, Eckler think, had 10 carries for 64 yards last week. So what, what's, what's going on this week? First, Eckler needs to unhook the trailer. I'm not sure if you saw the video of him. He broke to the outside. And I don't know if I've... In my head, Austin Eckler was faster than he is, but everyone, it was going viral on the internet. It was like everyone else was sped up and he was slowed down in the video, but somehow they weren't catching him. Like it was so weird. Austin Eckler used to scare the crap out of me. I just don't think this offense knows how to use him, if that makes sense. Because yeah. he's such a special talent and he's not a Christian McCaffrey in that level but the game is similar he's he can run the ball but in the passing attack is where he really is going to kill you so he's still the guy that I circle on that offense that we have to stop him we have to make sure that he's not getting the ball in open space and making stupid you know plays five yard plays turn into 20 yard plays because so, that's where the Chargers want to beat us, is a big play here or there. So Keenan Allen is their best receiver. He's been around forever. Um, I can't wait for Collinsworth and to show us the graphic of Zay Flowers being drafted after it's Quentin Johnson. Oh, yeah. Johnson. You know, yep, Quentin Johnson. You know it's coming, especially after the rough last – how last week's game ended. You know that's coming up very fast. So that's the thing. Like, we're going to have – Look, we're going to have a Chargers team that doesn't have an identity. They have two really, really good players and Allen and Eckler. Um, what do you think the game plan, though, is? Like, I, I'm not trying to put you on the spot because I know the Chargers lack an identity. But I, I'm trying to think because I, I continue to go with the theory. Now, maybe the run defense is slowing down. I just think we were a little gassed. I still think the strength of our defense is the run defense. And the way you beat us is by going no huddle and making our defense tackle stay on the field. Do you yep. think the Chargers will try that, or what do you think they're planning on doing? I see almost – like you said, that would be the smart thing to do, is to do that, go no huddle, because they don't have the running attack to go up, especially in the trenches. Their O-line is not going to be able to beat the Ravens' D-line consistently. But with that being said, nothing the Chargers have done this year has made sense. So who knows? They might come out and just try to run it the whole time. But no, they they need to go no huddle. They need to try to air it out, get the defense tired, get them on their back heels, and then try to get Austin Eckler in space with little screen passes, you know, delays, draws, stuff like that. But if they try to just, you know, sit there and we're going to run it, you know, 50% of the time, this game could get ugly very fast. Yeah, I really don't know what to expect. The Chargers, uh, from a gambling perspective, the times I bet on them, I feel like I don't have a great pulse on what they're doing. So let's move to – let's go to the other side of the ball. Mm -hmm. Obviously, um, we've had a few days to think about it. I, yeah. Look, I, I like to try to spin everything to a positive here with the Andrews injury. The one positive that I don't think is arguable is now we're going to get more touches for our other playmates. So yeah. I think for the last five, six games of the year, there's some value in that. Uh, other players will get the ball, um, develop some more rapport with Lamar. I think it's going to really hurt us, obviously, in the playoffs um, if he's not able to come back. But I know you mentioned, I think Bateman, you're probably the biggest Bateman supporter um, that I know. Is Why do you think that that's going to be Lamar's new security blanket? And just so we clarify, security blanket, and this is not a shot at Lamar, uh, but his accuracy, he likes having tall, big guys to throw to. Not that he can't be super duper accurate, um, but the reason that he's comfortable, the reason you refer to somebody as a security blanket is they have a big catch radius. 
Um, yeah. Is that why you think Bateman fits into that role? Yeah, and it's nothing against Isaiah Likely or Charlie Kohler. I think they're going to do well stepping into that role to try to help fill Andrews' spot, you know, blocking, running routes as a tight end. But what I've seen the past four weeks from Rashad Bateman, because I used to, I was not happy with Rashad the first few weeks. I was very much on the, this guy just doesn't have it right now. He doesn't want to be out there. But over, it was in, what, three, four weeks ago when he had that one catch where he wrestled it away from the defender, and suddenly you could, like, see a switch flip in him, and you're like, oh, he's back. And ever since then, it just felt like they were getting more and more comfortable with each other. He's finally getting back to 100%. They said all year he was still trying to rep up and get back there. It seems like he's finally getting there. And I just really like over the past few games, even when he's not getting the ball, he's right now, I think after Andrews, he's going to be the one that Lamar, when he's scrambling, is going to be most comfortable looking for. And he's most used to, okay, where can I find the open spot for Lamar? I said this last, I think it was our last podcast. I said that during the Joe Flacco era, I felt like I knew what the plays were going to be. I could like, I've, Sounds funny, but I watched so much Joe Flacco. I felt like I knew Joe Flacco, like he was my neighbor or something. I bet, can't tell you how much money I used to bet on these Ravens games. Anyway, um, so I used to just felt like I knew what the plays are going to be. Like I can just feel the Gary Kubiak little play action this way and the rollout and first down. So I have, do you, when you're watching the Ravens on offense, do you try to predict that? Like I, I'm just trying to get inside your head because yeah. I have, I don't even predict the plays anymore because I feel like I can't tell when Lamar keeps it, when he when he doesn't have it. As a fan, what is what's your view on the offense this year in particular? Um, and do you feel like you have a good grasp on what our game plan is going to be this week? I do, and I don't. And I think that's why what makes me happiest about the new how the Ravens' offense is becoming revamped is the fact that. We've seen games where we're like, okay, the Ravens are going to come out here and they're going to try to run the ball. They're going to establish the run. And the first drive, it's like six passes, two runs. They go down the field and score. And you're like, oh, okay. And then some games were like, okay, they, they come out passing first. And it's like, oh, they just had an 11 play drive where it was eight runs, three passes, and they scored. And that is where I don't want to say it's become a bigger positive or bigger impact this season from last, because I think there are still some highlights of how it was ran last year that were very positive, but I like the way that Munkin is, I, I want to say switching it up, but in the fact that, like you said, before I felt like throughout years, I could sit there and go, okay, we're probably going to run this play here. Yeah. Then we're going to try some little bootleg action, get Lamar on the run here, get a guy in the tight and now it's like, I can't do that. And I'm like, okay, maybe that means either I'm paying less attention or the offense is becoming more complex. Yeah, the Lamar the Lamar factor, I, I think the only thing that frustrates me right now from the offensive perspective is I don't quite know, and I, I think with Andrews being hurt, um, what that go-to play is um, in the yeah. tight game. Like what, I, think the, I think things have to revolve around Flowers. Um, I've seen enough from him that um, – the, that, that's why I think in, in a certain way for the next few weeks, if we make flowers, the focus of the offense, the Andrews, um, cause look, Andrews, the security blank, but he has to be fit. You know, he was frustrated in training camp for not getting the ball. And that just puts, uh, I don't know. I wonder if Lamar plays more free. And this is again, not taking a shot at Andrews, but as a basket, I kind of related to basketball when it's like, all right, my best player is not here, but the rest of these guys, like they might not be good enough for us to go the whole way. Yeah. But good enough for a couple games here if we make the offense revolve around them. So I actually expect us – I expect Lamar to play really well Sunday night. He's got a chance at the MVP. Um, I feel like I'm back on the bandwagon. I know I've been like, I don't feel great about this team. But I don't know. I, I feel I feel really solid going into this week. I just don't know exactly what to expect from the Chargers. Although it's weird because I feel the same way where I'm like – I'm very much like this is the Ravens. I, I keep thinking like this is the Ravens best chance and I'm not sure it's because this is the best Ravens team. I think this is one of them, but I mean, Burrow's out. 
this is the Chiefs. If there was a Chiefs team that was ever as beatable as this one, I don't know what it was. Because since Mahomes has gotten here, this Chiefs team is the team that you can beat. Then you have Josh Allen and the Bills aren't doing much. They are week to week. It's a whole new team every week. The Dolphins can't beat anyone if your record is above 500. So it's a weird season where the Ravens are doing so well, but the rest of the league is kind of crumbling. And it it almost makes me feel more pressure of like, oh, this is the year we have to do it. I'm glad you said that because, first of all, the the, the uh, salary cap dictates that it's this year and next year, and then yeah. they really have to revamp it. Um, the, a lot of the money kicks in. That'll be an off-season conversation. <clears throat> Excuse me. But I'm glad you said that because I, I want to throw out the most positive scenario and then the most negative scenario, but both of them are realistic. Even mm-hmm. though the AFC is watered down this year, and you just pointed out um, we have a chance, obviously, to get the one seed, our schedule – is so tough that if they lose this week, the playoffs are still not guaranteed. And if you're a Ravens fan, first it's getting to the playoffs. So as much as I want the one seed, as much as that's a nice conversation to have and you get big picture, it's important to realize, like, you don't want to put yourself in a position to lose this week, have the bye, and then that Rams game is going to feel like a must win because then you have the Niners and the Jaguars. Mm -hmm. So you can't really – if just let's just be nine and three, and then I'll feel because I want to be the one seed too. Maybe you disagree with me, but I don't know. It, it, do you think that it makes a, a major? I think the major difference is having that bye week. Yeah, but maybe I'm still scared from the Ravens Titans game, and Harbaugh's been great on the road. So I don't know. I don't necessarily care if we end up on the road. Yeah, I'm not. I'm like you, just getting the just getting the playoffs. Once we're there, we can figure out from there how we're gonna you know make the run. But it really is if we're the one seed, if we're the eight seed, just get there, and then we can or the seven seed, just get there. And they and win we'll, this week. Yeah, they win this week, and it feels guaranteed. Yeah, um, nine and three, you're feeling really good. You just have to win pretty much two, one, two right. maybe of the final five. So you don't need to be eight. I just know I, that's why I think they're going to come out focused because Harbaugh probably bribe them with uh, several off days. We can stay in LA, whatever you guys want, but we're not going to be eight and four going into a bye week and then stressing out about this Rams team, knowing we have the Jags and the Niners right after. So it, it definitely, it's a big night. I'm excited. I'm glad it's Sunday night. I feel like I'll have some time here to yeah. finally wind down from all the football. What's your plans uh, for the rest of the day, rest of the weekend? Uh, football, football, more football. Uh, that's going to be as much as I just said that spent all day, you know, watching crappy football. I'm just like Michael Scott said, I'm ready to be hurt again. I'm just, I'm ready to turn it on expecting so much fun. And it just be like nine, seven in the fourth quarter. So I'm going to let you go on this note. Um, I thought about it and I was like, should we spend 10 minutes on it? Or should I just ask you for about two minutes at the very end? And so I'm going to do two minutes at the very end. Um, I really wanted us to re-sign Kyle Gibson. So you can just make me feel better here um, because I don't want to argue with you, but just tell me why it was the right decision not to re-sign him, please. There's just better fish out there. I love Kyle Gibson, everything he meant to the team as a veteran. I think what he ha- his impact from players I've talked to, every single one of them, when you mentioned Kyle Gibson, their faces light up. They loved Kyle more than anything. And but on field product, there was better. <laughs> on field product, there was better. I I I love giving. You would do the team. same thing. You would make the same decision. Yeah, I I don't think th- I never thought there was ever a chance. Sadly, he came back. I think now we might look in two months from now and think, oh crap, we didn't get any of the guys we were hoping we'd get, and now we wish we had Kyle Gibson, and that's a bridge we may have to cross. But at this moment, with the names out there they needed to take another step in the rotation. Unfortunately, with his spot being open, that was the spot to go. So so I'll let you go on this. Is that the, with the caveat that we signed somebody better? Or do you think we have, whether it's Hall or Wells? And we no, this them. is the caveat. We signed someone better. Because if we caveat. don't, then would you feel like we should have brought Gibson back? Yeah, I think that, yeah, that's where we'll suddenly in two, three months sit here if we – don't get one of those guys. We don't make a trade, nothing. Then it's like, okay, now there's a hole in the rotation. So you're, you're, so just so Orioles fans can uh, take a deep breath and prepare, you are confident that we will make a transaction of some sort 
that will tell me definitively that this guy way better than Kyle Gibson. Plus we have these three, four other guys that will fight it out for spring training. And it was the right decision to uh, not resign. I think, I think, and I don't want to get hopes up, but I, I would say I'm very confident the Orioles are going to make not a splash per se, but a splash for us Orioles fans, something that we would consider like it might be another team's like, Oh, decent signing. But for us, like it'll be like a three year, you know, $30 million deal. And we'll be like, Holy crap. Do you think that, do you think that's more likely than trading one of our better players um, for a pitcher? I, I personally want to trade. I want to do both. I think you do both. Um, but I could see them trading for a starter and signing a reliever. Or okay, a big, guess, big time reliever. I went from two minutes to I knew I wouldn't talk about the Orioles forever. I love <laughs> the Orioles. All right. It was great talking to you. I'll let you roll. Um, give us uh, – so I know – look, it's a weird week. What did you guys – when are you guys recording next? When's the next show? Yeah, we'll go. We will record on Monday. Yeah, we recorded Wednesday instead of Thursday this week. But yeah, we'll be back on Monday, seven o'clock. Well, we say seven o'clock, but it's more like seven o five. We never run on time. I, I'll be real. So like seven o five next week. <laughs> so you get a whole weekend to marinate on everything that happens and give everybody. Uh, you're still the best. I mean, I'm not just saying this because you're on here, but it, you do good a great job of reminding us of. Um, whether it was like 2000, whatever, eight highlights of Ravens chart, whatever we need to watch. So follow yeah. us on Twitter. Appreciate you. Um, appreciate you, man. So I'll see you next week. See you next week. All right. Good luck, everybody. Thank you.